Gratitude waits to receive something. Gratefulness just waits for us to recognize that if life is a gift and we're always receiving it, every moment that we're alive, we're receiving Mm. something. Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today, we welcome Christy Nelson on the show. Christy is the executive director of A Network for Grateful Living. Her life's work in the nonprofit sector has focused on leading, inspiring, and strengthening organizations committed to progressive social and spiritual change. Being a longtime stage four cancer survivor moves her every day to support others in living and loving with great fullness of heart. She's the author of a really great book called Wake Up Grateful, the transformative practice of taking nothing for granted. This book really touched me, which is why I reached out to Christy. And in this episode, I talked to her about this a concept she has called gratefulness. She differentiates gratefulness from gratitude by describing the former as an orientation towards life without being dependent on internal or external circumstances. Christy shares with us the practice of stop, look, go, and her five guiding principles that can inspire you to live a life of gratefulness. We also touch on the topics of positive psychology, mindfulness, play, and self-compassion. Christy has one of the biggest hearts I've ever seen, and you can just tell in this podcast that she really wants to help everyone lead a really grateful life and meet life on its own terms, regardless where they are in their own journey. So without further ado, I bring you Christy Nelson. Christy, it's so exciting to talk to you today on the Psychology Podcast. Scott, I'm so happy to be here with you, really, truly. I'm so happy to be here with you as well, and what a tremendous book. (laughs) <laughs> wake up grateful. Do you still wake up grateful every day after all these years of of having that mantra? I actually do really well. It's I'm not sure I go to bed grateful every day, but I wake up grateful every day. I do. It's much easier for me, the waking up, honestly. I find waking up in the morning sometimes is really tough. Um, I really uh, just want to go back to bed for the rest of the day. Mm. Mm. And does waking up grateful, does that energize you to get out of bed? We have to hang out more often, honestly. Mm -hmm. Um, Yes, it does. I mean, for me, I kind of get up and I think people who have almost died wake up and they have that sense of, phew, another day. Like, oh my gosh, here I am. It's another day. I can't believe I get another day. So there's something about not taking the day for granted, which is huge. And I think it's easy to do that. And so... That's something I think that we can cultivate and inculcate and learn. It's not just an organic state of being because it wasn't how I was. Um, it's much more so now. So, I mean, I hate to say it, but facing the possibility of not being alive mm. makes people appreciate life a whole lot more. Yeah, you had an experience um, at age 33. You're diagnosed with stage four Hodgkin's lymphoma that had metastasized to your spine. That doesn't sound good. No, that, it really that's wasn't. Not something, it's not <laughs> like, I feel like that's not the kind of news I'd want to hear. No, especially when you know that stage four, it's kind of like there is no stage five. When I learned that, I was like, uh, okay. So it's also called kind of end stage. Which yeah. Means, what do you do with that? Yeah. 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 What do you do with that? That's what the book is about, really, honestly. And what do we do every day? Because in so many ways, I mean, not to be too trite about it, but it reminded me that I was mortal in a big way at a young age, at an age where a lot of people are really taking for granted they've got a ton of life left to do what they want to do and live the way they want to live. And and I'll be grateful when, I'll be grateful when. And instead, it's like, whoa, if everything shrunk down to this very small uh, the aperture gets very small <laughs> on the lens, then I think it shifts how we experience our capacity to be grateful for what is and for the moments that are that we're here. I love that spirit. It's a little bit of a, a different uh, thing than the research literature on gratitude. Could you kind of talk a little bit about the difference between gratitude and your concept of gratefulness? So gratefulness, wish it was my concept, but <laughs> it's one that I've borrowed heavily from a lot of people who are kind of big existential thinkers and mystical thinkers and spiritual people, you know, and so we, our website is gratefulness.org. It's a great URL. But I really love, I was so excited to be in conversation with you because I love to use the word hedonic and eudaimonic. Those terms, to me, gratitude is very hedonic. It's self-satisfying. 
It's in the moment. It's pleasure seeking. We want to feel gratitude because we've gotten exactly what we want. Oh, yeah, I got exactly what I want. And um, but it's super fleeting. It's highly conditional and uh, very susceptible to all kinds of things. And so it comes and goes, you know, and to me, I equate that with happiness. Honestly, I think happiness is a similar phenomenon. I think it's really r- very conditional. That's so reasonable. grateful. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, I love that. Mm. Yay. Reasonable. Got it. Um, mm. so gratefulness on the other hand is a, is kind of a deeper proposition. It's something I call an orientation to life. It's something that comes from the inside out. It's not conditional on external circumstances that come and go. So when we can cultivate that as a practice, like mindfulness, when we can, you know, situate ourselves in gratefulness and, learn that it's a musculature that we can build actually then we become way more resilient and it's a it's a much more robust way to go into life because gratitude is not robust at all i would even amend your gratefulness definition say it's not dependent on external or internal circumstances right That's because true. Y- you can be grateful even if you're not feeling like you want to get up in the morning it may have nothing to do with any external circumstances but your neurochemistry is like, forget it. Yeah. There's often a little bit of a, um, you know, a little battle in, internally, I think, sometimes between those yeah. parts of ourselves that are accustomed to, yeah. um, I, you know, we all struggle with it. So, you know, mm-hmm. the all the emotional dwarves, you know, that follow us around, you know, the grumpy and cranky and um, whiny and all, all those ones that we all have. But I think gratefulness is able to say, Oh, okay. Here I am and I'm feeling really blue. And that's kind of interesting. Like, isn't there something interesting about feeling blue? Like, what's that about? And it's engage, it's a way of engagement. It's about embracing something and trying to befriend rather than bemoan. Right. So that for me, that's one of the places I try to start, which is what, you know, gee, let's look at you, you know, crankiness. What, what are you here to teach me? What, what do you want from me? What am I supposed to do with you? Because nobody's grateful every single, all, we're not grateful about all the things in life and we're not grateful easily all the time, but it's a practice that we can be grateful in every moment. But I think that's a, something that we develop. Yeah. And we have to keep exercising. Uh, when you're age 33 and you had that experience, you did go through a period where you had a lot of gratefulness, but then you had something, and I thought it was a really interesting phrase that you just um, kind of like just casually throw in your book but i was like oh that's a really interesting phrase you said gratitude tolerance you said at a certain point you started to develop gratitude tolerance so so even you even yeah. you oh you know, yeah you, you can you can have this kind of start to take life for granted yeah that's easy i mean i think the honest truth is that it's a wild roller coaster and i think there's so many things in life that steal our perspective mm. that um that we steal ourselves against in that particular way of using the word steal, and that also are stolen. Like, it's like, there's so many ways in which we give ourselves away to things and um, things that catch us. You know, we're living in a, in a wild culture that has huge amounts of influence on us. And so all those kinds of practices about being aware and awake, attentive, alert, alive, all those things, those mindfulness and the things that we do to try that for wisdom, for well-being, they are vulnerable to so many things in life outside of us and inside of us. What were you doing before you, at age 33, what were you, what was your job? What, what, who are you <laughs> uh, apart from the gratefulness.org stuff? Like, who, okay. who, who is Christy Nelson? That's such a big question. I w- was living in Manhattan. Uh, that was an interesting space of time. What part uh, Lower of East Side. Mm-hmm. It's important to get all the, the oh, it rich is. imagery it is here. Yeah. Thank okay. you. And I yeah. walked, I walked down to Soho every day for my job in the wow. East River Savings Bank building. Oh, and man. so I was working in a nonprofit organization. I was executive director heading up this organization focused on food safety. I'd always been concerned about environmental issues and was a, was kind of an activist when I was, you know, younger, pretty active activist. And, um, but I was, you know, it was also so interesting because to be honest, I was one of those people who people said, if you could get cancer, if you could get cancer, because we had beliefs about cancer then, I think, 
that it was much more um, a punishment for something. You know, it was the days of Bernie Siegel and Louise Hay and a lot of people who said you kind of only, bad things befall you only if, you know, for bad behavior or for bad choices and that you can work your way out of it. So for me to end up with this terminal cancer, I did yoga. I was a vegetarian. I was passionate about my life, my job. I had great love and community and friends and family. And, and so it was like, I think it blew people away. It demystified this idea that we had of cancer, which was something I think at that time was pretty dangerous, which was Mm. if you didn't want to get cancer, you wouldn't get cancer. Wow. Wow. So that really, yeah, it completely uh, violated your expectations in the world. Like that's just what we talk about in the field of post-traumatic growth. That idea is really powerful. I think that I think people in, there's a lot of danger in positive psychology, honestly, I think where, where people are able to say to themselves, if you just think right, if you get your attitude right, um, nothing's going to befall you. And, 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 oh, if it does, you're going to be able to survive it. And if you didn't, <laughs> if you don't, then it's because you didn't want to live enough. And I heard that a lot until I started to get to know a lot of people who didn't make it through these journeys. And I thought, you know, this is a really dangerous fallacy that our attitude is entirely in charge. You know, that's sacrilege to criticize positive psychology. You're not allowed to do that. (laughs) Do I get to do that here on this show? Yeah, of course you can. Um, At Erewhon Organic Grocery in Venice, California, they have the sign, uh, big sign that says, have the best day ever, where every time you walk in, if you could change that sign to one thing, what would you change it to say? Have a grateful day. Yeah, yeah. I on think brand. it's a whole lot more promising. On brand, <laughs> on brand thank you. <laughs> but but the best day ever. I mean, and people do say that, and I I have a lot of people I love who say that to me, and I'm like, oh man, so it just has to keep getting up, and it just makes it hard. It makes it hard on on all of us. You know, it's hard enough to go through life. Man, things are tough. Yeah. You know, yeah. Life is really challenging. The world is not. You know. Um, so I, I think that there's a lot of things to be said for. Um, for facing squarely what is in life and figuring out how to be grateful in the face of all of that. And that's to me different than being happy. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, that's a very important distinction. Where, where does the idea of humor come into play? Do you see a link between humor and gratefulness at all? It's so important. Yeah. You know, brother David. Yeah. Oh, humor is just, it's everything. He, um, Brother David Steindl Rast, who founded this organization, and he's an incredible Benedictine monk and this thought leader and interfaith, uh, extraordinary leader. And he is one of the funniest people. And he really believes that the more grateful we are, that the more childlike we are in many ways. Yes. Right? Those yes. Eyes, the eyes of, the eyes of wonder. Those yeah. eyes of wonder, which see everything new in a way, right? <laughs> ah, bug eyes, um, curiosity, play, those kinds of things that kids have so much more intact than we do when we're older. How do we reclaim some of that energy? Because um, I think when you also realize that life is precious and it's short, <laughs> you know, that it's, that it's, we have no idea how long we're going to live that how do you want to live those days? And I think there is something that shifts, which is for me, there's some throwing caution to the wind and being playful in ways that I haven't been playful, being loving in ways that I haven't been loving before being bold and courageous. And yes, you know, yeah, I think taking life for granted puts a big squelch on all of that. Yes. Well, they say that the mind and body are deeply interconnected, deeply intertwined. Do you feel like cultivating this gratefulness practice helped you delay the the, the cancer from mm. from evading and further invading your body? And yeah. I don't. It's a good question. Mm. I don't. I don't believe in formulas. You know, in those kinds of ways that like people say, just do this and think this. And I, I think it's way more complex than that, honestly. I think life is way more complicated than. Well, how are life. you alive? That's a really wild question. I think there's so much mystery and it's, I think mm. it's not like rewards get doled out. 
in direct proportion to your goodness, to your good attitude, to the good deeds you do. I think, you know, their life is a lot more wild and unexpected and uncertain than that. So I'm, I'm in this wild dance, honestly, of continuing to be alive, Scott, and I have no idea how long that's going to live, how long I'm going to live and how long that will last. And that has helped me live more fully so that no matter how long I'm around, I feel less regret. I'm more able to go, I think, honestly. I don't want to go. I want to be here. But those living that way is pretty powerful. Wow. I'm grateful you're here. Oh, you are. That's my Thank grateful, you. gratefulness. Thank you. I'm grateful yeah. to be here with you. Such a special book you wrote. And well, I actually encountered your articles and interviews before I read the book. So that, that, all that stuff was special to me as well. And, uh, just really love, love this, uh, work you're doing. Um, let's talk about the five guiding principles. Is that okay? Can we do that? Yeah, yeah, um, please. What, yeah, one is life is a gift. Talk a little bit about, about how, how is life a gift? Doesn't always feel that way. Yeah, it doesn't, does it? <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, um, you didn't do anything you, to get here. You didn't do anything to get here necessarily. It was given to you. It's a given. Um, and it is, um, you didn't have to earn it. You didn't have to, it just is here. Here it is. So every day life gets like, here we go here. It's given to us every day. And, um, I think all the things that like, often we have gifts in life. I know that you, you know, the article that you wrote for the Atlantic also acknowledges this, that sometimes there are gifts that come out of really difficult things in life. We rarely recognize it in the moment, but life is a gift. Every moment is a gift of, of life that we get given and we have no idea how long that gift is going to last. So we're not in charge of that gift, which part is part of what makes it be the experience of being gifted. And I think I'm not saying life is easy. I'm not saying life is always great. I'm not even saying life is a blessing necessarily. Mm -hmm. Life is a gift. What you do with that and how we work with receiving. And so what I say then afterwards, the other part of that is when you greet each moment gratefully, you're always receiving. So part of what that's about, Scott, for me, is that gratitude waits to receive something. It's a response to something. So this was, let's check this out. Gratitude waits to receive something. Gratefulness just waits for us to recognize that if life is a gift and we're always receiving it, every moment that we're alive, we're mm. receiving something. Mm. We're able to breathe. Yeah. We're able to be here. So it's like more like instead of construing it as something outside yourself, it's like, oh, wow, here it is. I can be grateful right now if I stay open yeah. and feel grateful for the moments I have. Then gratitude is not elusive. It's not pinned on something. It's not pinned on the future. It's not so conditional and dependent. Good, 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 good. Okay, let's go down the list. Everything is surprise. It is. Everything? Mm -hmm. Pretty much. That's a surprise. That <laughs> it is, surprise, isn't it? Surprise me. Uh, well, you know, I mean, I think that, I know. I liked. Joke. I got meta, it actually. It's meta, yeah. <laughs> meta joke. Um. <laughs> so, I think that life is uncertain. I think that life is really, really. The truth is, there's so much mystery, and we have no flipping idea where life is going to go and what's going to happen next. It's so. Instead of being surprised when things happen, to just say everything is surprised. Here I am, I'm available for what it is that's going to unfold. And when you open to wonder, that's what the idea is. So open to wonder. Opportunities abound. So everything is surprise. Can we stay open to surprise in life and be much less like, oh, I had these expectations. Oh, I thought I was entitled to this. Oh, it's supposed to go a different way. You know, those kinds of things are harbingers of, as you know, a lot of disappointment, a lot of being incredibly bummed and incredibly anxious. And, you know, we all suffer that. But the more I can cultivate the attitude of, you know, life is full of surprises. Life is basically a mystery, a huge mystery to so much of us. Isn't there a Madonna song? Yes, I was just going to break in. Mystery, and Right. 
right home. <laughs> well, see, dun, 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 dun. I'm sorry. Where did can, I just go? Can we dance? I just, did, later, yeah. later. Yes, later. Okay. Wow. I'll do that later. Madonna's either really deep or really superficial. Dancing is such a gratefulness practice. Hello. I agree. What's the relationship between dance and uh, gratefulness? <laughs> I mean, what's the difference? So humor, dance, all the things that you like. Yeah. The more grateful you are for them, the more you're going to be in, the more you're going to be enlivened by them. Right? Like if you just say, if you say, Oh my God, I love you, put on music and you're enlivened by music because you love it so much. Otherwise it's just like this thing in the background, but be enlivened by the things you love. Love that. Well, let's, let's, let's continue this list because it's a great list. The, the, the ordinary is extraordinary. It reminds me of uh, Abraham Maslow's uh, notion of the plateau experience, of seeing the miraculous in the everyday, um, and how that's a great route to, route to transcendence, even more so than the peak experience. Um, so it seems, it seems relevant to that. What's your, your thinking? You, you being the expert on that, all those things in your beautiful book, too, and Transcend. Mm -hmm. So um, I think the ordinary is extraordinary is, is one of my it's the core principle. It's the central principle on so many levels, which is it's extraordinary to be here. It's extraordinary to be able to breathe. It's extraordinary to have a body. It's extraordinary to be able to sit here in this conversation with you with the aid of this technology. And what we have come to take for granted is so tragically ridiculous, honestly. We just take these things for granted and more and more extraordinary things keep coming our way. And then we keep needing more and wanting more. And yet there's something about being able to see the extraordinary in the ordinary that is so joy producing. And so it's kind of, it's, it's dangerous and radical a little bit, actually, because I think that it is a contentment producer in a way that our society is pretty hell bent on not having us be content and having us operate on scarcity. If you see the ordinary as extraordinary, it can kind of blow your mind. I mean, I sometimes feel like, and I've said, you hardly want to leave the house. It's like everything is so mind blowing, mind blowing, awe inspiring. Cause it so, is. Okay. Tell me what you see when you look at this glass of water. <laughs> I see a glass. I see a glass that is four fifths full of water. Approximately. What else do you see? What's extraordinary about this? That you have a glass at all. I think the fractals, shape of the glass. All those you things, the, the crystals. Do you see the yeah, fractals? Yeah, it is an incredible. And there's lines oh, that go up from them. And amazing. when you hold it in front of your luminescent brain behind you, yeah, you should yeah. see the light that comes through that is crazy. Yes. Yeah. The I psychedelic it's man. I think it's, it's really awe-inspiring. I mean, if you think about these things... I'm just going to say, because I dare to hear that, you know, there are people who have, have been having psychedelic experiences for a long time. Yeah. These principles also stand in that way. The or, you know, the ordinary is extraordinary. What else gets illuminated in yes. these kinds of experiences and mystical experiences? Everything is surprise. Like all of a sudden, everything is awe inspiring. Life is a gift. So these are really core essential principles. And. I think they awaken us to living in a way that is way more enlivened and enhanced and attuned than we live most of our days. Yeah. So let's go to number four. Appreciation is generative. What's that mean? <laughs> I mean, it actually makes stuff happen. Like when you appreciate things, when you appreciate people, when you appreciate what you have, it, you know, it is our world so much thrives in the space of appreciation. And, you know, when you, when we take care of the things that we love. So the second part of that is when you tend what you value, what you value thrives. Yes. So appreciation is attention focused through gratitude, right? So mm -hmm. grateful uh, attention is appreciation. And so when you appreciate people, out loud, voraciously, unabashedly, um, when you appreciate the things, that, all the things that you have, it makes you need less in life. I think we're much more cognizant of 
than what is what is extraordinary and miraculous about what we have. And what we have tends to thrive much better in the field of appreciation than neglect. You can just say that. That's pretty basic. That's a cycle. So like the more you generate, the more you get appreciation in your life. Like, mm. isn't it? It seems like a cycle. Like, what if you're like, your life is really, you're not generating a lot and you're constantly reaching failures. Isn't that likely to downward spiral into depreciation of life, of your life? These things seem like, like they're upward and downward spirals. It's such a good question, right? Like, the more you take for granted, the easier it is to go down. The more you appreciate what is and what you have, it's easier to go up. Yeah. Um, for sure, for sure. And, one of the things that I think is interesting is, you know, I don't know if you talk much about kind of the law of attraction model, but, you know, there are people who believe that if they appreciate things, they, they appreciate things in order to get more. Do you believe in that? No. That not very scientific. I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, <laughs> marginalize myself here from a lot of the people who, but I, I think it's an interesting motivation. I think that there's a, there's, I mean, it's not very scientific, but also it's not very, um, it's not based in re- in reality. In the- yeah, exactly. It's just like, I usually equate the two. <laughs> yeah, it's, that's true. So you call it science. I call it reality based, yeah, but yeah. I think, and grounded, you know, in this way, which is, I don't think just because you want something like that's what I said about life just because you want to be alive that's the danger people who say just because you want if you want to be alive enough you will live right what that means is everybody who dies didn't want to be alive enough oh that's I don't like that and if you don't have a boat and you don't have a house and you don't have a car and you don't have a you know a gorgeous lover then it's because you didn't manifest it adequately and you didn't want it enough and I just don't think that's the way that the world works no, I agree. But you do have a, a philosophy in your book, Say Yes to Your Life, which is very Viktor Frankl. I, in fact, uh, the, the humanistic uh, existential psychotherapist Viktor Frankl has a whole book called Say Yes to you, Say Yes to Life. Your, your model of gratefulness is very, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Akin, uh, akin to that. Yeah, it's akin. Rela- akin. Re- akin. It's related. It's highly related. Yeah, and, yeah. and I think, you know, through your article, I learned about existential gratitude. You know, and yes. that's fascinating. And Frankel's tragic op- optimism. You know, how do we make, s- how do we work through and work with what is, what befalls us in life and that we don't get to be in charge of everything? And things are really hard in the world right now. Like I, you know, it, I have to make sense of it by the idea that I've always felt like if I'm in joy or I'm, I'm in appreciation in some way, or I'm really in a space of great love, that it's a betrayal to all the suffering going on around me. I've had to reconcile that for myself in a way that I think is, it's very significant for me. And it's something I have to continually work at is because there's some way in, in which I've had to make sense of the fact that when my heart is more joyful, when I feel more grateful, and when I have more love in my life, I don't betray my concerns for the world. I actually nourish my capacity to attend to them effectively. That's the, I'm more able to be present. I'm more able to be of use, of service, because the truth is, it's like I learned that grieving for my mother. Mm. I didn't know how to work through grief for my mother when she died, and she died yeah, pretty young. And when I was writing the book and, and learning how to hold grief and gratefulness and realizing that they honored each other yes. was really important. Yes. So it's the same, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And the, you mentioned presence as, you know, it seems so important for gratefulness is to have a, a mindful attitude towards whatever's in front of you. Mm-hmm. Do you do you do you have a mindfulness practice yourself? That or absolutely. Do, oh, you do. Yeah, Lo- long, long, long standing. Study with John Kabat-Zinn forever ago. Wow, wow, the legend, the legend the himself. Legend. He's a beauty. It just does seem like it's very hard to cultivate this gratefulness without without cultivating cultivating the mindfulness and um, in a really uh, sustainable way. Mm. 
Totally agree with you. And I know you, you know, you're around a lot of people who are mindfulness practitioners and teachers and, you know, there's a lot to look up to there. I think great gratefulness owes a huge debt to mindfulness, right? So mindfulness is about presence. And, you know, I will remember though, this is interesting is one of the things that was challenging for me when I was studying mindfulness was um, when I was sick. So when I had mm-hmm. cancer and there was a period of time I could hardly walk and, you know, I was, so it was a challenging time for me. And one of the instructions with mindfulness was to have my eyes closed and I had just gotten out of being in a hospital for months Wow! in a little room in Upper East Side. <laughs> um, and I, so I, I came out and I was like, wow, I am so grateful to be able to be outdoors. How do I reconcile these things where I don't want to go sit in a room and just close my eyes? I mean, yes, the inner world and nourishing, nourishing the inner world is so important to me. And yet I also wanted to be able to be mindful in a way that took in everything around me, the blessing, the beauty, um, knowing that tomorrow could be my last day. So that was interesting because gratefulness also gave me permission to, in a mindful way, walk through the world with my eyes wide open. It was beautiful, this passage you said that you're in, you're in the hospital room and um, and you said, like, I, I can appreciate the, the nurses, you know, the doctors, right? You were like, I mean, I'm not doing your quote justice. Can you quote yourself here? Because it was, it was beautiful <laughs> what you said. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, I don't know if I can quote myself, but what I knew was I was in the hospital for weeks and weeks and weeks. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, when you're 32 years old and it's summer and you're in, in it's, I wanted to be outside. It was like, it was so painfully hard. And I had to be, um, isolated a lot because I was TB positive. My immune system was super low. And so, um, I couldn't see a lot of people I loved and people were far away. And I kept thinking, you know, this is really awful not to be around to the people I love. And yet all day long, a stream of people were coming into my room, taking my blood taking care of me, you know, bringing me food, taking the trash away. So what became clear to me was, if you have no idea how long you're going to live, why would you not love these people? Why would you not make this be a source of that longing, a a fulfillment of that longing that you have to be in connection, you know, to feel alone. And there were, people streaming all around me all day long uh, was a was a great irony and a big eye opener for me it was a wake up call i think this segues into number 5 which is um <laughs> love is transformative mm-hmm. you know like yeah what what were you doing there in that moment to kind of generate more more love mm. love changes everything, I believe, right? So, and being big hearted and being whole hearted and full hearted as we live our lives, it can change everything in our midst. And there's so much need for love and it can take a very small, a small amount of love to completely change somebody's life. I've experienced that myself. You know, it's not just the long, long long-term relationships that change our lives. Sometimes it's chance encounters. Sometimes it's an act of kindness. Um, but it's love really can transform a life and to believe in that and to freely embody that, to be generous, I think is an extraordinary calling. And so the, the second part of that principle is when you embrace the great fullness of life, which is a term that I use a lot, which is the great fullness means everything. If you, when, when you embrace the great fullness of life, your heart overflows. Mm. And partly that is what for me, is the truth about when I get up in the morning and I know that there is so much going on in the world that's hard and, you know, how am I going to put myself vis-a-vis that to let my heart, to let my heart overflow is really the the only way. Um, and that means feeling a lot of tenderness, a lot of vulnerability, a lot of things that are not easy to go through the day with. Yes. Um, brokenheartedness. <laughs> yeah. And yet, and yet it's worth everything. So, so yeah, those are the five principles. We ain't done yet. We ain't done yet because, uh, you know, there, <laughs> there's also the stop, look, go. 
Oh yeah. Uh, well, then there's framework. That. <laughs> then, then there's that. You're funny. There's a lot. No, there's a lot in your. We could talk for hours. We, we won't have the time to. But there's there's, <laughs> so, there's so much in your book. There's this framework. Stop. Look. Go. Uh, from uh, Brother David. Right. Yeah. Can you uh, yeah. talk a little about that? Yeah. So it's it's very simple. It's basically saying, you know, Brother David says, you know, what do you do before you cross the street? You stop. You look. You go. So it's basically about for me, you know, how I like to describe it is here's a way to think about it too. Gratitude, as it's commonly understood, celebrates green lights. Like, whoa, the best day, right? The best day is like, okay, you're going down, you get like 16 green lights in a row. And yet I think gratefulness also celebrates the fact of the red lights and the yellow lights that basically we have to stop. We actually, life requires us, if we're going to be mindful, if we're going to be awake, if we're going to be here. Otherwise we, we croak, you know, you can't just keep going, 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 but our culture says, okay, just green lights, green lights, green lights, green lights, gratitude, gratitude, keep going, you know, happiness, happiness, think on the bright side. You know, it's not the way that life works all the time. So I think intentionally stopping, which can be either for a split second Mm. or to sit on a cushion for 45 minutes, whatever, 20 minutes, 10 minutes, whatever you do looking, which is to listen inside ourselves to look, to notice, to feel, to look around us, to be present to what is. It's really the yellow light, which is yield, notice, look around. Like (laughs) that's what it is. And then go, go into life with the recognition of, for me, it's like, what am I taking for granted that I can lift up in my awareness and see as a privilege? Mm. So in, and there's no end to that Mm. when you start with the breath. If you start with the fact that you're breathing and your body is working and you're actually here, the number of miracles, the the number of ridiculously, incredibly complex things that are having to happen in order for you to be alive and breathing unassisted right now is enough to blow your mind. And I don't mean that in a way that's namby-pamby. I'm saying it's like if we can really rest in that awareness, it's pretty awe-inspiring. And then notice all the things that are happening in your body that allow you to breathe, that allow your heart to beat, that are, you know, the the miraculous things about your body. So you just start there. Start with your your very existence. Yeah. Yeah. The nice thing about anchoring in your breath, Scott, just to say, is that as long as you're alive, you're going to be able to anchor there. Mm. So if you can be grateful for the breath, it's enough to be grateful for the next breath, Brother David says. So it's like, if you can be grateful for this breath and then just go, that's the stop. Notice that and then go. It's a pretty extraordinary thing because everything else is a bonus. <laughs> everything else <laughs> comes after that. And yet we take it so for granted. And then a lot of you law narcissists who just feel entitled to it too. Not right. only do they take it for granted, they're entitled to more than just the breath. Yeah. yeah. Oxygen therapy, man, like do a thing, all the stuff, whatever. I mean, entitlement is a big, is a big inhibitor, right? So. Oh yeah. We didn't go down your whole list of inhibitors, did we? We don't need to. No, no we people don't. Get it. People get it. People get it. Yeah. I mean, we know expectations we know. are, you know, we have assumptions, expectations, entitlement. They're, they don't make life better. No. Um, I wanted to talk about one of my favorite sections of your book it's called be yourself with abandon it's towards the end love that one i love it i love it love it love it can you integrate that one can you combine that one with the the one befriending our our full selves i think befriending your full self and be yourself with abandon is they're highly interconnected so right i mean there's no separation yeah exactly there we go so who the hell else are you going to be right so it's this is who you are this is who we are this is a moment that we're in i mean i think wear it all on your sleeve be who you are. I love the idea of, you know, I used to be so hard on myself. I, you know, it was, you know, for everything that didn't feel just perfect about me or that I compared myself to so many people and stuff. And so I think it's really wonderful to just kind of say, what are our quirks? Like, what are the quirky parts about us? What are the idiosyncrasies? What are the things that we, you know, and so how to, how to befriend those to me is also, you know, like I said, literally those seven dwarfs, it's like cranky, whiny, grumpy, you know, if it's stressy, worry, you know, it's like all the different parts of me and to be able to go, 
you know, there you are. Hello. Hi. <laughs> you know, like, check you out. It's so nice to be welcoming to those aspects of yourself. Mm. So to me, be who you are with abandon is just, you know, be the quirky, funny, oddball, insecure. I'm very good at that. Truthful version of yourself. You're, yeah, you're so many things. So, and it's what makes you most lovable, you know, in the end. And it's, and it's such a, it's such a great way to go through life. Like Mark Nepo says, you know, our fears just want to be held. You know, we can't always have somebody else hold the parts of ourselves that we want to disavow, but maybe we can do that for ourselves. And I think it's a, if we can't do it for ourselves, what are we expecting somebody else to want to hold on to those parts of us with us? You know, it's like, so I think it's a great, it's a great lesson for self-compassion, huge self-compassion practice. And then also self-celebration. I mean, why stop at compassion? No, I agree. Self-celebration. I, I love that. I'm writing that down. Let's just end uh, on the topic of leaving a grateful legacy. Hmm. How do I do that? How do I do that? Well, it's really hard. I think it is living without taking life for granted and basically saying, um, what matters most? How do I put that in motion now? How do I show that now? Who do I love? How do I tell them now? Because otherwise you're great. Like your legacy is all the choices you make today. It's not something that you're going to put into on paper when you're, you know, 65 years old and you're going to leave somebody some amount of money your legacy is how you treat everybody today. It's how you show up to life today. So that's the promise of not taking life for granted is to say, oh, I'll do that when, mm. you know. I think being, it really is. Being, being grateful being. versus doing grateful. Yeah, yeah. Be, mm. embody. Be it. I love it. So that's pretty simple. Thank you, Scott. No, it's look. simple. It's simple, but not easy. <laughs> it's not easy at all. We need these reminders, and just even just reading your book again, you know, got got me. You have to keep. You just have to keep reminding yourself of these things. You know, it's it's very easy to forget that and get lost in the stream of life. It's worthwhile, and I always feel like it's really worth trying. What do you have to lose? What do you have yeah. to risk by trying it on? Yeah, and. I think what's really powerful is like you said, kind of that gener appreciation is generative. The more you live gratefully, it's interesting to notice what come, what happens. Yes. How much more grateful you can be. Cause right. When you're putting yourself out there in a way, what comes back to you is always interesting. And how is that reinforcing? And so I think it's an adventure and it's a risk worth taking. And it's a great practice to build this musculature. And I really appreciate your interest in it and your um, your wonderful attention and care. Oh, my pleasure. I'm going to try to practice these five things the rest of my day. And I encourage our listeners, give it a shot. As Christine Nelson says, what do you have to lose? You know, try it out. Leave a comment in the YouTube channel or on the or on the, our webpage. Let us know how it worked out for you. We love honesty. So um, anyway, Christy, thank you so much for being on my podcast. I'm glad we're finally able to record this session. Thanks, Scott. Really appreciate the time and, and keep going. Keep doing all the transcending beautiful work you're doing. Oh, thank you. You too. You too. Okay. Very grateful. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.